I think that we've all had times in our lives where we've had uh, two different rules or two different principles that uh, we both, we wanted to follow both of them. We thought they were both important, but at certain times they seem to kind of run in opposition to one another, or maybe they seem to be at least in tension with one another. Just a couple of examples. Maybe uh, it's important for you to get somewhere on time, but you're running late and it's really important for you to get there on time. And yet you're also driving through an area that you feel like you have to go slow in to be safe. Maybe because it's a, it's a neighborhood where lots of children are playing, or maybe it's a curvy and windy road where you know accidents frequently happen when people are going too fast. Or maybe someone uh, is, is very much mistaken about something that's not trivial, that's very uh, important, maybe it's important for their own well-being, and so you feel like you, you have to point it out to them, uh, but you also don't want to hurt their feelings in the process. And so those two desires maybe are going against one another. Or maybe it's the classic scenario of hating the sin, but loving the sinner. We sometimes talk about, and sometimes it gets talked about in society, if it's even possible to hate the sin and love the sinner. But that type of discussion can go from being theoretical to being very personal really quick when someone that uh, we love and we care deeply about may begin to make some very bad choices. And suddenly you have to make sure that your frustration and your hurt is directed in the right way and at the right time uh, because you know that perhaps this person that you love needs to change their behavior but also you would really uh, you really don't want to lose that relationship with them uh, if, if at all possible i'd like us to think about a similar situation this morning as it pertains to outreach when the scriptures talk about engaging our world there are two principles in place in scripture that can be very hard to apply at the same time on the one hand, Scripture tells us to go into all the world, to get out there and engage the world with the gospel. But on the other hand, Scripture also tells us to keep ourselves unstained from the world. That's the last few words of James 1.27. And Scripture tells us to not let the ways of our world, materialism and selfishness and greed and immorality, to not let these things taint or corrupt us. And just like we have kind of coined the slogan, hate the sin but love the sinner, we often summarize this idea with the phrase, be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the world, but not of the world. But just like that phrase, hate the sin, but love the sinner, be in the world, but not of the world, that's one of those phrases that is really easy to say and really easy to agree with, but much more difficult to put into practice in our personal lives. And I don't believe it's impossible. I don't believe that either one of those teachings is impossible. I don't think God is asking us to do the impossible. But it's not always easy, is it? It's not always easy to try to change the world around us for good uh, without the world also changing us as well, and perhaps changing us not for the better. And so I'd like us to think some this morning about being in the world, uh, but not of the world. And in trying to apply both of these teachings, to go out into the world, but also uh, to remain unstained by the world, and trying to apply both of those principles, Christians have generally gone in one of three different directions. The first direction is withdrawal. Withdrawal. Sometimes uh, we can put so much emphasis on living holy lives and not letting the world corrupt us that we distance ourselves more and more from our world and from those who do not follow Jesus. And at the extreme end of the spectrum, we might think of someone like a monk or someone like a hermit. But a person ha doesn't have to be a monk uh, to, to basically withdraw from our world. But withdrawal puts a great emphasis on protecting and sheltering ourselves from the sinful, sinful influences of our culture and our society. That's withdrawal. The second common direction is assimilation. Someone who assimilates themselves into a community or into a culture is someone who becomes fully part of it. And so assimilation in a spiritual sense means involving ourselves so much with our world and with those who do not follow Jesus that along the way we begin to compromise our convictions. And we begin to compromise the gospel more and more until there really isn't very much of the gospel and much of our faith left. And so assimilation can begin with a great and a very good emphasis on getting out into the world, but along the way, the world ends up getting more into Christians, and that's assimilation. The third direction is what I'm going to call this morning realistic engagement. 
Realistic engagement. Realistically engaging this world means going out into the world with our eyes open. It means going out into the world fully aware that we must engage this world with the gospel if we want more people to come to know Jesus and enter into his kingdom. But we're also fully aware that Jesus has said that many will resist and many will reject the gospel, and we know that not everyone will respond positively. And with realistic engagement, we're also well aware, we're fully aware that there is a degree to which we must keep ourselves separate from the world. Or over time, if we don't do that, over time, we will assimilate into it. And it probably goes without saying this morning, but assimilation is something that really hurts or in some cases completely removes um, the opportunity to show the world what authentic Christian living looks like. And so I think that we all know that neither of the first two directions that I've mentioned this morning, withdrawal and assimilation, I think that we all know that uh, neither of them will result in effective or in transformative outreach. It's the third direction. It's realistic engagement that we should want. But realistic engagement never happens when we are passive about it. If we are not intentional about reaching out to our world while holding on to Jesus, then we will either never reach out to our world or we will let go of Jesus. If we are not intentional about reaching out to our world while holding on to Jesus, then we will either never reach out to our world or we will let go of Jesus. And so if we are not intentional about being in the world but not of the world, then it just won't happen. And so the first thing I'd like us to think about this morning is that we must be intentional about realistically engaging our world with the good news of Jesus Christ. But thinking about that brings us back to our main concern for this morning. Am I in the world or of it? Am I working to shape the world around me or am I letting the world shape me instead? I know that that's not an easy question. And I'm encouraging us all to ask ourselves this question this morning, but I know that we may find that it doesn't have a completely clear answer. And that's okay. But we have to be willing to ask ourselves this question if we're going to make, if we're going to take Jesus' instructions seriously when he talks about going out into our world while also being faithful to him. We have to be willing to ask ourselves this question. So our scripture reading for this morning uh, that Gunnar read for us is part of where we get this idea of being in the world but not of the world. In 1 Corinthians 5, uh, starting in verse 9, the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian church, the Corinthian Christians, that he had written to them in a previous letter about staying away from people who are practicing sin, particularly sexual immorality. But then in this letter, in 1 Corinthians, he clarifies that he didn't mean when he gave that instruction to stay away from people who were doing these things uh, who are unbelievers. He didn't mean to stay away from unbelievers who were doing these things because that's really impossible. That would mean having to go out of the world, and they can't really do that. What, what he meant was to keep away from followers of Jesus who were doing these things. But he didn't want Christians to go out of the world. He wanted them to be in the world, but not, but not of it. And so this is where our basic idea, where our phrase mostly comes from, of be in the world but not of the world. But even though this is the verse, these are the verses where that basic idea comes from, we can actually look back a couple of chapters earlier in Paul's, in this same letter, in, in 1 Corinthians, to find some words from Paul that we can use to examine ourselves and get a better idea of, of whether we are in the world or we have uh, becoming more of the world. And so back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul reminds the Corinthian Christians that the cross and that the salvation that is offered through the cross, he reminds them that it means different things to different people. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So to those who accept the gospel, it is their salvation. It is the power of God. But to those who reject the gospel, the whole thing just looks crazy. We are so used to uh, the idea of salvation coming through the cross and through Jesus dying on the cross. We're so used to that that we forget how bizarre of an idea it was uh, originally, this idea that salvation could be offered through someone dying uh, the most shameful and the most humiliating death that the world had to offer at the time. Uh, but, and that's why, that's a big reason why it looked crazy to people who did not believe the gospel. 
And then a few verses down, Paul elaborates some more, beginning in verse 22. This is what he says. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So Paul's world was divided up into Jews and Greeks, or Jews and Gentiles, and neither group really liked one another. Neither group liked each other, but also neither group liked the gospel either. Uh, the gospel was not what either of them, Jews or Gentiles, uh, were looking for. And so Christians in the first century looked rather strange to the rest of the world. And so maybe a good question for us to ask as we ask this bigger question this morning, am I in the world or more of the world? Maybe a good question for us to ask as we evaluate that is, does the world think that we are strange? Or does the world think that we're normal? And I don't mean strange in the sense that we wear strange clothes or have uh, odd personalities or that we eat food that most people in our culture don't eat. I don't mean strange in, in those ways. I mean, do unbelievers look at our faith and look at our convictions and think that we fit right in with our culture and with our society? Or do they look at our faith and look at our convictions and notice that we represent a different culture, a different society, that we represent the kingdom of God? Do they notice anything different, perhaps, about how we talk to other people, particularly people that, for one reason or another, we might find especially difficult to talk to? Do they notice anything different about the way we talk to them or the way we talk about them? Is our langu language and our conversation strange? The things that we choose to talk about, the things that we choose not to talk about, and the way that we choose to go talking about, go about talking about those things. Do they notice anything different about what we value in life? about how we spend our time, or who we choose to spend our time with, or how we perhaps spend our money? Is there anything strange about our attitude and our outlook and our focus in life? And I know I'm asking a lot of questions right now, but the big question that sums up all of those questions, do unbelievers look at us and think that we're just like everyone else? Or are we at least a little bit odd to them? I think that could be a good indication of whether we are in the world or of the world. Something else that Paul says uh, about examining ourselves regarding being in the world or of the world has to do with where we find wisdom. This is what he says a couple chapters later in chapter 3. A more modern way of saying where we find wisdom uh, might be talking about where our worldview comes from and what it is that shapes our worldview and what it is that shapes our perspective. This is what he says beginning in verse 18 in 1 Corinthians 3. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. Paul was aware that the gospel that he preached and the gospel that he taught was not super popular with the wisdom or with the worldview of his time and his world. Again, the very idea that salvation could be offered through a man dying on a cross, that just sounded foolish to Paul's world. The idea of not honoring Rome's gods and not honoring Rome's, Rome's emperor, which was the source of, Roman success, of Rome's success in the minds of, of the Romans, that sounded really foolish to the rest of the world. And this next one may sound strange, but humility was not considered a virtue. It was generally not considered a good thing in Paul's world. Humble people were considered weak and passive, and yet scripture repeatedly teaches the godliness of humility. And so Paul's instructions to the Corinthian Christians here is that if anyone among them thought themselves really wise and really well-informed and really enlightened according to the standards of that world that they were living in, then they needed to think again because the wisdom of this world is folly or foolishness to God. And God is the one who determines what is truly wise. I know that our world is in some ways uh, very different from Paul's world. And it's also, in, in other ways, not so different. And so the things that are considered wise or enlightened uh, today are often different from what was considered wise and enlightened back then. But still, I think the basic truth and the basic principle remains the same. The world has ideas of what is smart and what is wise and what is enlightened that are different than God's ideas. 
I know that our culture and our society is complex, and so a lot of the ideas that kind of make up the common worldview of our society often contradict one another or at least run in tension with one another, and I think that's to be ex expected because our society and our culture is complex. But still, many of the ideas that are so common in our culture stand in clear opposition to Scripture as well. How about the idea that might makes right? that the person or the group with the most power, they're the ones who get to set the tone. Or what matters in life the most is being happy and not hindering the happiness of others. Or how about the idea that my personal truth is just as valid as your personal truth? Or how about the idea that nothing, absolutely nothing, should ever get in the way of my individual and my personal freedoms? Or how about this idea? This is one that you see floating around on social media a lot. The idea that if you think differently from me on any topic that I deem to be very important, if you think differently than me and don't see things the way I see them, then you must be a bigot or you must be lying to yourself or you must be deluded. There can't possibly be another explanation. There just can't be. I don't want to dissect any one of these ideas right now. I'm not really wanting to focus on any one of them. Uh, and, and as we think about ideas that are very common in our society and our culture, you might be able to think of some others that could go right alongside the ones that I mentioned that, that really do not align with Scripture very well. But I don't really want to focus on the specific ideas this morning. What I really want us to ask ourselves this morning is this. What is it that shapes my own understanding of wisdom? Is it our society, or is it the Lord? Amen. Is it the world, or is it the words of God? Amen. Let me encourage each of us, and let me encourage you this morning, to continually, not just one time, but to continually test our ideas, test our sense of wisdom, test our values and our ethics, test these things against the word of God. And I know that sometimes that might be uncomfortable, and that's okay. All of us are continually growing. All of us are continually being refined in our walk as followers of Jesus. And that refinement and that growth sometimes requires being uncomfortable. But it is important that we choose to make our Lord and we choose to make his wisdom the source of our wisdom and guidance. It's important that we do that because if we don't, then something else will come along and something else will fill that role instead. And so I've tried to encourage us this morning, I've tried to encourage all of us to ask ourselves some questions that I know, again, are not always easy to ask. And like I mentioned earlier, they may not always have a crystal clear answer in our lives. Sometimes it's just hard to determine if we are in the world as we should be or if we are becoming of the world instead. And sometimes if we talk about specific issues, uh, when, when kind of the rubber meets the road and specific instances where we have to decide what is in the world, what is of the world, sometimes I know that the line between those two things becomes rather fuzzy. And if we were to have that type of discussion, I think we would quickly see how fuzzy that line can sometimes get. But I want you to hear me this morning. Even though the line can get fuzzy, that doesn't clear us of the responsibility of drawing that line in our personal lives and drawing that line also collectively as a church. And so let me encourage you to daily choose to realistically engage our world as representatives and followers of Jesus while also choosing to remain faithful to the Lord's call to holiness. And I know as we try to take these two ideas that sometimes are in tension with each other and as we try to hold on to both of them, I know that we will stumble and fall sometimes. I'm sure of that because we're human. But if we will keep coming back to the Lord through his word and through prayer, through the fellowship of our brothers and sisters in Christ, if we will keep coming back to the Lord, then I think that we will continue to shine as lights in a dark place and we will continue to represent Jesus well and we will effectively reach out to our world with the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, uh, if you feel as though perhaps you have become more of the world than in it, and you would like prayers from this church family, perhaps for forgiveness or for strength or for recommitment, and you would like the prayers of this church family, as we sing our song of invitation, you are welcome to come forward and uh, we will receive you and we will pray with you. Uh, or if you have any other need, if you have not come to be in Christ yet, and you have not begun that life of discipleship through faith and repentance and baptism in the beginning of a life uh, walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Or if you have any other need, I encourage you to come now while Jonathan comes and leads us in our song of invitation. If you would be standing, please.